One and all, welcome in week three. This week, we're going to focus on two topics. First, we're going to continue topic related to uh, decision making. Specifically, we're going to investigate mechanisms that may make it more likely to, uh, to use heuristics in decision making and show different kind of biases while making decisions. In the second part of the week, we're going to focus on money and happiness. Okay, let's focus on mechanisms that make it more likely to use heuristics and find some biases uh, in decision making. So agenda for today is uh, to study cognitive overload, self-control as a mechanism of um, of guiding uh, behavior and I hope that you will see how depletion can lead to uh, inappropriate decisions and, uh, not rational decisions in, uh, to some extent and uh, finally we're going to focus on the problem of how overload can change our decision-making process. For this week, uh, please make sure that you've uh, read those uh, articles for this meeting, for this lecture. And also, as additional reading, uh, I would like to recommend Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Let's start with a practical example. This practical example describes a situation as follows. Three men uh, doing time in Israeli prison recently appeared before a parole board consisting of a judge, a criminologist and a social worker. The three prisoners had completed at least two-thirds of their sentences, but the parole board granted freedom to only one of them. Guess which one? Was that case number one? He was hurt at 8.50 a.m. An Arab Israeli serving a 30-month sentence for fraud. Was it the case two? Hurt at 3.10 p.m. A Jewish Israeli serving a 16-month sentence for assault. Or maybe that was case three. Hurt at 4.25 p.m. An Arab Israeli serving a 30-month sentence for fraud. What do you think? Who was granted freedom? Actually, in reality, that was this person. Why that uh, happened? Why do you think? Actually, this example shows a specific mechanism uh, that can be found probably not only in the uh, Israeli uh, judicial system, but also elsewhere. Let's take a look at a study by Danziger, and that was published in 2011. They analyzed uh, more than a thousand judicial rulings. Uh, they took into account rulings by at Jewish Israeli uh, 50 days in a 10-month period. Majority uh, around 80% concerned parole requests. The researchers, so the team by Danziger, they collected information about each case to determine whether case characteristics influence decision making. So, for instance, number of previous uh, incarcerations, gravity of crime committed, months served, rehabilitation program in place. What was the problem in this case? They wanted to investigate how judges make decisions, whether there is a specific pattern in their decision making. They found also that within the period, judges served uh, between 14 and 35 cases per day. Normally, they had six minutes on average per case. As you may see, so many 
decisions could have led to uh, decision fatigue. Those judges, they had three uh, sessions per day, separate by two breaks, uh, morning snack and a lunch. Not much, not many breaks. What, what's the major outcome of this research is that, that the percentage of favorable decision drops gradually from around 65%, so uh, in this cases uh, freedom was granted, to nearly zero within each decision session and returns abruptly to, again, 65% after the break. So as you see, in this case, it was not really important what was the magnitude or the gravity of crime and numbers of uh, previous incarcerations, months served, and so on. The only pattern that they've been able to identify was that after a break or in the morning, more people were granted freedom than at the end of the day or just directly before the break. That says quite a lot about how uh, at least this group of people make their decisions. This problem indicates that under some circumstances, when there is not enough time, where a human being needs to make a lot of decisions, then decisions are not really uh, rational, because to a great extent they can be a result of specific thinking and also as a result of uh, cognitive resources available. That's the mechanism. Let's maybe take a closer look at the mechanism of the overload. Of course, we are not going to discuss all possibilities. I'm going to introduce one of the most important, prominent mechanisms of decision overload, uh, which is self-control. Self-control literature is defined in two ways. First of all, definition focuses on a self-control as a process. So it takes into account dynamics of what happens inside a person, but also it takes into account behavior and dynamics of behavior. On the other hand, it's also studied as a specific trait, as patterns in thinking and in behavior. Later on within the course, you will see how trait self-control can affect our eating behavior and how this data can be utilized for nudging consumers' behavior. Self-control as a process can be studied in multiple ways. This is one of the examples of uh, this kind of study. In this study, Mitchell uh, and his colleagues, they've been trying to investigate what happens actually in the brain when a person needs to self-control uh, behavior. This uh, control was considered as ability to inhibit or to suppress thoughts. In this experiment, they've used well-known paradigm thinking about white bear. Actually, in a suppress condition, participants were asked to not to think about white bear. As you see, uh, in this uh, data, in this figures, there were differences between two conditions. One condition was suppress, Another condition was to 3D think about the white bear. Those authors were interested in what happens in specific parts of the brain, in this case that was ACC, anterior cingulate cortex, a part of the brain that was or is typically involved into different cognitive processes and is really important in control of behavior. So it this kind of um, part of the brain has a huge impact on our eating behavior, addictions, and so on. They found a difference in a signal in the brain that was identified with fMRI scan. Also, they will uh, be able to identify specific patterns in time. So that's part C. So as you see, if uh, people are forbidden to think about white bear, 
there is a specific difference between this condition and control condition when it's permitted to think about um, white bear. It's a pretty simple study, but it shows that specific region in our brain, important region that is responsible for control, is involved in self-control. Of course, we know more about self-control. Psychologists, they define self-control as an ability to inhibit. Also, they identify that typically self-control is engaged when there is an activation on long-term goals. People monitor their actions that are motivated by those long-term goals. So if something is important in our life, we want to achieve that within a year or two or three years, our mind focuses on these goals and tries to block our behavior if the behavior does not lead us to attaining specific goals. Researchers found that there are three elements that are important for successful self-control process. First of all, standards. Those can be personal or social. So people learn what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to um, obtain uh, goals. To some extent, those goals are also set by the society. Second element is monitoring. So it's mainly attention and resources that can be allocated to monitor actions. So it's really a thoughtful process. And finally, feedback and corrections. Because when attaining goals, people learn what leads them to the goal or what uh, make it not possible. So what deteriorates um, specific resources that can be useful in order to attain specific goals. When studying self-control, resources found that there is also an important role with impulses and found that consumer behavior is determined by self-control strength but also by impulse strength. So it's an interaction between two specific processes, affordful, which is self-control, and impulsive, which is automatic, that also can be characterized in terms of strength. And self-control fails if it's too weak or when the impulse is too strong to make it possible to control its consequences. So researchers found that typically self-control, low self-control or low strength of self-control depends on inability to successfully control so some researchers think that watching TV all day long does not help uh, to uh, monitor our actions. Lack of cell criticism. So for instance, obesity can be seen as a problem where people are not able to critically think about the, um, their body, how it looks, and are not able use this negative feedback to correct their actions. So still they eat too much. Finally, researchers think that low self-control can be a consequence of lack of self-awareness. So for instance, people uh, do not think about the personal standards, all those standards are not activated or diminished by consumption of alcohol. In many cases, alcohol can lead to decrease in self-awareness. Thus, people, even if they behave impulsively, are not able to control their behavior due to the fact that alcohol reduces self-awareness. One of important aspects is also the focus. If people are focused on long-term goals, then can be successful in attaining those goals. But if they are focused on short-term goals, that increases highly a chance to fail at self-control. Many other factors, for instance stress, can lead to mental fatigue, can increase how we perceive demands. So if you are really stressed, then we perceive even small demands as something unbearable. 
One of the interesting mechanisms that can be found in different situations is that um, zero tolerance effect. In many cases, when people want to overcome their impulses, they assume that they will no longer tolerate behavior that indicate that um, those impulses are in control. So, for instance, people who would like to uh, stop drinking alcohol, they say sometimes, yeah, from today I'm not going to drink even a drop of alcohol, not a sip. The problem uh, is that if we set such an unrealistic standard and we fail, we still believe in ourselves, in our strength and powers uh, that can help us to overcome uh, negative behavior, to help us to reach long-term goals, for instance, to stay healthy. On the other hand, high strength of impulse can depend on multiple factors. So, for instance, can depend on automatizations. Research found that rituals, um, ritual eating uh, chocolate or rituals like drinking beer every uh, evening, make it harder and harder to inhibit those reactions or those rituals in the future. So, for instance, if a consumer drinks a beer every uh, evening, then it's harder to stop this habit after a month or two. So, in this case, not having bad rituals can heavily help to stay healthy, thus to make uh, rational decisions related to your own health. Also, they found that emotions, uh, mainly positive emotions, can activate specific associations. Those associations can be simple or can be complex uh, and then can guide to uh, behaviors that either aim at sustaining this positive mental state or even increase it. So that's why after drinking one beer, consumers have this tendency to drink either more beers or even a stronger alcohol because that assures that later on this mental state can be positive. Of course at this point people they do not think about long-term consequences of drinking too much like hangover because they are so focused on short-term goals. Also negative emotions matter in this case. Negative emotions can guide behavior in the way that people want to reduce negative emotions, that they make a specific decision, for instance, to consume alcohol because they think that that can help them to reduce negative mood. Also, it's pretty obvious that the more appealing is an object, the more um, the stronger is the impact of impulse on behavior. So that's why uh, producers they make packaging so attractive to the eye of consumers because the more attractive is a packaging more willing or that's at least uh, in terms of probability uh, more consumers can pay for specific product and finally uh, it's also interesting effect related to what increases the strength of impulse is a snowball effect the snowball effect can be explained Plain in terms of that eating a piece of chocolate drives motivation to eat more chocolate. So eating one piece increases the chance that you will eat and the whole bar, which is of course not a good decision at all. Also, in this research by uh, Cassie, uh, one of the most prominent investigators of self-control from the United States, they found how powerful can be positive mental states and actually positive emotions that we from time to time see on others face. In this study they were investigating ability self-control in context of positive and neutral uh, facial expressions. They also found that specific group of, uh, of people, teens, teenagers in this case, they are not able to successfully control their behavior to self-control 
uh, when they see positive emotions. It's the same case for teenagers, but also uh, for a group of people who can be considered as low delayers. So people that are not able to successfully delay gratifications. In both cases, teenagers and low delayers, so people who are not patient enough to wait for a word, um, are not able to successfully control their behavior if they are primed with positive emotions. It means that uh, there is a, a practical uh, dimension of this uh, research. It means that some group uh, of people are really heavily or can be really heavily influenced by positive uh, emotions when they uh, making decisions. Their decisions can be uh, more irrational, can lead to uh, different, let's say, troubles, um, can be detrimental, for instance, for their health. Based on the research, we can conclude that self-control can be fatigued because exerting self-control reduces the amount of strength that is available for subsequent self-control efforts. So for instance, you uh, want to try to uh, live healthy, but due to uh, stress, due to different demands, uh, difficult job, it may not be possible. Because if you're lacking uh, in self-control resources, then making a good rational decision after a really demanding day can be really hard. In a meta-analysis of 83 studies, they found relatively strong effect of ego depletion. They've been testing this ego depletion effect, so uh, effect of fatigued self-control, based on different type of tasks, like effort, perceived difficulty, negative uh, effect, subjective fatigue, and many other things. And they found that, yeah, indeed, this effect can be found in different uh, domains. Recently, we did a multi-lab uh, project which replicated the ego depletion uh, very nicely. So, why doesn't uh, why doesn't really matter for making decisions? We can see that some of the biases that we can observe in behavior, and also likelihood of using specific heuristics in making decisions, can be a consequence of fatigue. So, can we ask a question? Biases are biases a consequence of fatigue. We can say that according to the strength model of, uh, of self-control, decision making decreases ability to control behavior. For instance, Voss and colleagues show that making decisions, so lots of decisions, was negatively related to self-control and cognitive performance. It means that if you enter a store and you need to make lots of decisions whether to buy this or another product later on, you probably are more likely to buy more products, products that you may not need because you buy them because they look appealing. Or maybe you think that you can use them later on. This uh, kind of effect was not only studied uh, while people are making uh, decisions in stores, but also people use more complex designs in order to investigate this defect. They found that making complex decisions is even more detrimental for our future behavior than making simple decisions. Voss and colleagues, they, as you probably know from the paper, they investigated rather simple decisions by yes or no. But Vastlund and his colleagues in an eye-tracking study, they found that complex decisions make it ego depletion effect even stronger and they've been able to investigate even more biases in decision making processes as a consequence of uh, than a consequence of simple decision making. During a meeting we are going to see how that actually works. Uh, while uh, online you're going to click this link and we're going to investigate to see how it actually works. We're going to see in a class whether this kind of effect can be replicated uh, 
in a specific context, buying computers. In the final part of this presentation, I'm going to show you another model, which is more complex than the ego depletion effect, because it takes into account a specific process and many different factors that can change how we make decisions. This model was proposed by Chernev as his colleagues based on uh, their studies on choice overload. As you see here, we have two parts of this model. On the left hand side, we have antecedents of choice overload. On the right hand side, we have consequences of choice overload. Choice overload happens depending on number of options, and typically that's the most important part that leads to choice overload. So if you need to choose between 7, 8 or 10 different products, that can lead to choice overload. And finally, uh, as antecedents, we have four types of moderators of the effect of number of options. First, we have choice set complexity. The more complex is the choice set, the higher is the choice overload. Also, they found that decision task difficulty also moderates the effect. So it means that if consumers they have to choose between many options and also it's difficult, for instance, to compare those options, then choice overload is stronger. The same for preference and uh, the same for preference instantaneity. So if people prefer to have clear cut options, then more complex uh, sets of uh, options make for them choice overload harder. The same for decision goal. If decision goal is to make really most rational choice ever, then the choice overload can be more severe. It means that if a consumer has many options uh, to choose from, then a decision, for instance, to make most rational choice can heavily increase uh, the effect of number of options. Thus can lead to choice overload. And what are the consequences? Consequences are twofold. Subjective state and behavioral outcomes. As you probably will see later when discussing the problem of money and happiness, subjective state can be one of the most important aspects of consumer behavior. Choice overload can lead to lower satisfaction if there are more choices, can increase choice regret or decision regret, and also can re reduce decision confidence. It means that if consumers they need to select from many options are less confident than they've made a good decision. In behavioral terms, choice overload can lead to delaying uh, decisions. So people can wait until making a final decision. And maybe later on, as a consequence, they either do not make a choice or again make a bad choice. Also, uh, as a consequence of choice overload, people are more likely to switch between options. Assortment choice and option selection are related to future choice. So as a consequence of choice overload, people can change their strategies and preference for different types of assortment. Final element is a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis in psychology, especially for consumer behavior, are really important because help us to conclude about patterns and to what extent we can generalize those effects on other occasions. As you see here in the upper part of this graph, there are effects related to high choice load, so many options. As you see, based on the effect sizes, Cohen's D effect sizes, effects in those high conditions are typically 
higher than zero. In some studies, effects in the high conditions were zero or negative, but nevertheless, in overall effect, the effect of high condition was positive. On the other hand, effects of low conditions on uh, decisions that people have made were lower than zero, were negative. So it provides information and confirmation that choice overload truly influences our decisions making, what we think about our decisions and our future preferences. That's it for now.